I want to talk to you about, uh, I called it here, it's a little bit clickbaity, so I just wanted to improve my chances that the committee is like, hey, that sounds interesting. So actually, the idea is, okay, let's level up our existing IDPs, our internal developer platforms, and say, okay, how we can integrate Wasm and Dapper to deliver the best value for our customers. So it's a little bit more on the platform engineering part, and I found it very interesting because, now let me go to the next step, this is probably something you may or may not experience already to, to, to bootstrap a new project. So it's uh, depending on the size of the company. I'm coming from Germany, as you can hear. So um, depending on the enterprise you, you're working at, it could be a very easy thing calling somebody. It could be something very, very difficult and you don't know where to go to bootstrap a new project. And this could be from the source side, but also from the infrastructure side. Or if you figured out the way, that's also something. I mean, I worked in a place we had ServiceNow, so you created your ServiceNow ticket and then you played the second game, the waiting game. So, quickly to myself, my name is Engin Didi. As I mentioned, I'm from Germany. Um, there are a lot of uh, socials here, so the latest edition of my socials are Blue Sky, so you will find me also on Blue Sky if you are actively there. I'm working at Pulumi as a customer experience architect, so really uh, being uh, with a lot of customers in the pre-sales area when they already signed and they're like, hey, let's do this, let's do uh, X, Y, Z and so on, can you help me? Um, I love cloud transformation, cloud enablement, this is really something and uh, continuous, continuous build, continuous deploy, it's my forte. So as you can see, Obviously, the talk will be a little bit more surrounded for how to enable, how to extend your platform, your infrastructure, your landscape to uh, give your internal customers, your developers access to Wasm. And if anybody here is from the developing side, then it's also interesting to see what your uh, DevOps people, platform engineering people do in the background to deliver you um, the best experience. So, I will go through different topics. Of course, 30 minutes is not enough to give you a really, really deep view into every pieces, but here I try to, to, to slice every part of the platform engineering to, to end the end, to create this, uh, this package that you can consume, um, and that you can deliver your Wasm application on your internal developer platform. Okay. This is something you may or may not see in your company uh, with some extras. Maybe some pieces are not there, some pieces are already present. So we have three different uh, groups of people working on here. We have the security team, the developer team, the operations or SRE team, and then uh, the developer team creating now the, the application and then committing it hopefully to a, um, to a version control system. And then depending again on the setup in your company, there is a CI system reacting on this push on the uh, version control system and starts to, to, to create an artifact, running tests and all this stuff, so tests should be there. And then uh, when the artifact is created, hopefully a CD process also kicks in and deploys your application to the, uh, to the, um, to the infrastructure of your choice. And then comes the next point, uh, adding or leaving stuff like automated load testing, so you have all the supporting tools, monitoring, you may or may not automatically have it connected, or you have to call some people. In my place, I worked before in Germany, for example, uh, we had to call the penetration test people extra, so this was really uh, calling them up, and then the, the, the development team already dissolved, the project was gone, and what left was the project lead, and then he had to, to deal with the penetration testing team, which gives them an Excel sheets and yeah, horrible stuff. So this is, again, a typical thing. And now you add now the whole CNCF landscape to this. And I present this slide every time and I, I wonder myself, will I ever become an ambassador for the CNCF? Probably not because I always show this like it's something bad, but yeah you get this completely overload of tools, so what is the best tool? And now think about this, if you're working probably for a startup, it's maybe easy to, to remediate a, a bad decision, you say, oh, that was not the right tool, but being in a larger enterprise, a tool decision is crucial because you start to train the people, you start to maybe acquire support thing, so getting the right tool on board is really, really something complicated to enable um, your, your delivery, your, your workload you want to achieve, and now think about what I presented before, this typical way, but it's not always one way. We have 
different, different ways. So we have one team deploying on a, on a cloud infrastructure with a serverless approach, cloud run, Lambda, whatever it's actually used. Then we have another team probably running everything on Kubernetes, so we have to handle this Kubernetes delivery. Then another team uh, creating f maybe um, a workload for different, for a multi-cloud strategy, so we have also to handle this. So as you can see, it gets complicated, so, so everybody does uh, on its own stuff. And additionally, which we not mention all the time, is um, shadow IT. So then we have also people who just create randomly infrastructure or things in the cloud because they have access to this, and then we have also to deal with this. So now comes the situation, what was one of the things people come up and say, okay, um, we have now this requirements, we, we move into this, uh, away from the sysadmin world to a DevOps world, we come with the things, you build it, you run it, but we also find out, you build it, you run it, as you can see, gets very complicated and people do maybe stuff which they should not do or don't want to do this. So we come now into the realm of platform engineering. Yes, that's the new term you probably heard and if you later on this week also at the KubeCon, at the main event, you will get a lot of talks also around this. Quickly reminder, uh, what is platform engineering? So there are different, different definitions. I'm not claiming that this definition is uh, enough and uh, depending on who you ask or from which vendor they are, they give you maybe a slightly different uh, feedback. So in this case, platform engineering improves developer experience and productivity by providing a self-service capability with automated infrastructure operations. So that's very cool. I put this intentionally in because for me it's very important to emphasize the developer experience because at the end of the day, we as a platform engineering team, we want to deliver our internal customers, aka the developers, the best developer experience they can get. So, and the CNCF, of course, is also working on this topic. Again, this is a huge topic and you should really, if you're interested, dive deeper into, into the pieces. So there is a working group also going on. They created a white paper here around the platform uh, engineering and the platform working group. And then you see they come up with this nice diagram to say, okay, we have different layers here. We have the, the platform interface, typical tools. I'm not one to play here. The Kingmaker is something backstage. And then we have the platform capabilities for infrastructures, code, cross-plane, Pulumi, uh, Terraform, you name it. And then everything else on this one to say, okay, um, external secrets operator for secrets, identity management, and so on. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the responsibilities of a platform engineering. So we just mentioned, yes, um, there are some requirements. Yes, we need to design. I, did, I put this intentionally everything as a wall of text because actually there's another point I found again more important, so yeah, designing and implementing the infrastructure, automating all the deployment processes, providing troubleshooting support because, hey, if I'm going to use your platform and you promise me to uh, take care of delivering my workload, I have a question on this, I want to have somebody to, to talk to, uh, monitoring and all the stuff. And the last point is something uh, which sounds like casual, like, yeah, staying always up to date, that's the reason we meet here at these places, but yeah, it's also important. But again, for me, a most important part, what will be the decision making if your platform will be successful or not, is that you deliver the best developer experience to your customers, aka your developers. This is the most important part. So if you come back to your place and check with your platform engineering team, see again if they really listen to you and they really see you as the customer and you have a direct channel with them and give them feedback or they collect feedback for um, delivering the best possibilities. So. One ingredient is already done here. We talked about the platform engineering and uh, yeah, that's a team. Now we come to the next part. Why we are already here, and I love this one here. I love how confident he walks in with his mustache. I don't know if you know Friends, it's uh, a little bit an older uh, series. So who's this confident coming person in, you know, the new, new, new person here? And I would say here, we come now into WASM WebAssembly. So, I'm probably sure you saw this one three million times, so I will add to this counter plus one, this famous uh, tweet from Solomon Hikes to say, hey, um, if Wasm existed in 2008, we would have not created Docker and all this stuff. And there's some truth in it, and probably you already know because you're here at WasmCon, so I don't need to really deep dive into um, why you shoot Wasm. So I still, again, put some benefits here out and say, okay, what are some benefits here of Wasm? Why I think it should be considered in a uh, developer 
platform. So we all know the fast startup times. This is some point I, I really enjoy this much here around in the milliseconds. The near native performance, lightweight, very small size. So there were some comparisons to say if you really want to uh, deliver something very, very small, you go into the kilobyte area. Um, convenience and versatility, versatility. So the, the promise is built once, run everywhere. I mean, we heard about this in the Java world and so on, but here we have something which really works, delivering it on the ARM architecture and the x68 architecture. And then, of course, here, the security aspect from Sandbox by default. Again, I hopefully this is all stuff you, you already know because you're here at the VasemCon, so you're already into the ecosystem. So it was just a small reminder here. And now we come to the next point. So, okay, we know Wasm is a cool thing. We see the benefits of it, and we could uh, probably, our developer teams already approached us and say, hey, um, can we get uh, Wasm also delivered as a service? So here, there is a project that was announced this year at uh, KubeCon Paris that it's now uh, part of the CNCF project landscape. So it's SpinCube. This is an important uh, part here now of, the, uh, of uh, delivering this service for our developers. So again here, SpinCube, what does it um, consist? There are many, many talks, I think, also at KubeCon around SpinCube uh, in a more detail. So uh, SpinCube uh, consists of different pieces here. We have the Spin Operator, which takes care for deploying our Spin applications. We have a shim, a container shim, that we can run here, our Wasm workload on a, on a, a container D um, nodes. And then we have our runtime class manager so that we can uh, install the runtime, the Wasm runtime. And then we have the spin cube plugin. It's not 100% necessary that you need to install this, for example. In my approach, I really went down the YAML way, but you can also use the spin cube CLI to then create here the, the, the Kubernetes deployment. How does it look like? So we have here uh, our application development part with uh, the spin CLI, so we can create spin new. We can create here the, the scaffold for our project, sc uh, spin build, spin minus u to build it locally and so on. Spin registry pushes then to, to, uh, to push this OCI artifact. It's not a container, it's an OCI artifact. We can then push it to our internal registry like JFrog, or we can um, yeah, push it to, to uh, Dogger Hub for example, depending on what we do. And the last point is here, our, our spin cube scaffold. As I said, you could use this, you could also create the YAML, or as we're going to show, use um, the part of the platform we're going to create, kubectl apply, and then the, the spin app gets created, the spin operator is like, oh yeah, hey, I can handle this, uh, this definition of Kubernetes because it's extending the API with the spin app CRD. I know what to do with this, and then it's going to schedule this on our Kubernetes cluster with uh, all the magic behind. Okay, so second ingredients we already find also out, we have SpinCube. So now we want to deliver again developer experience, we want to deliver the best possibility, so let's take SpinCube and bring it to the next level and say, okay, how we can help the developers to even be more productive and think less about everything surrounding them. Um, not leaking any implementation details or something like this, so they're like, hey, I need to know uh, about uh, a specific uh, PubSub mechanism. So for this, we have Dapper and Keda, so we will throw also Dapper and Keda on this one. And here, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with this, so uh, uh, this is uh, from the French Revolution, it's the Triumvirat. Um, so I created now our SpinCube Triumvirat, so we have Dapper, Keda, and uh, SpinCube. So shortly again, um, why I think that uh, Debra, Keda, and SpinCube is the perfect uh, couple, uh, the perfect triple. So Debra is our distributed application runtime. The good thing, and again, this is very uh, in a nutshell to say, okay, with Debra, we have now the possibility to abstract infrastructure away so dev can focus on their application. So they get something injected, it's a sidecar mechanism, they get a sidecar uh, injected into their deployment automatically from the depot operator. What they all need to do is, hey, they know there is a component of type PubSub. They even don't know if it's a Kafka, if it's a RabbitMQ or something like this. They know, okay, there is something, they have an SDK or an, uh, an, URL, uh, an API to communicate inside the application, but don't need to think about this. So again, making life of development easy. 
And uh, Dapper is built here on the actor model, which allows you to uh, think about your code in terms of uh, communication, so who communicates with who, so it's a really, really interesting part. So Dapper helps us here to create this abstraction. Um, as I mentioned shortly, Dapper consists of different building blocks, so we have something for state management, we have something for PubSub, uh, security, observability, and so on and so on all with the thing that the development team doesn't need to know the real implementation. It could be, as I said, RabbitMQ or Kafka and so on. And yeah, the components are modular, so you can just implement them. And here you can see also every um, generic thing, like the state management. And at the right, you see uh, some product uh, which could be behind secret management. You have Key Vault, uh, AWS Secret Manager, or a HashiCorp Vault. So very interesting. But me, as a developer, I don't need to think about this. So, and now comes the next building block here. It's KEDA. It's our Kubernetes-based event-driven autoscaler. So now what we can do now is we can uh, plug this KEDA scaler to something specific to say, hey, um, please, KEDA, listen to my RabbitMQ, for example, or listen to my Kafka topic. And if there are a certain amount of messages on the queue, for example, please scale up my deployment. If there's nothing, I could say, hey, please scale it to zero. So that's very important. So then I can say, okay, I don't have any, any unnecessary workload running because there is nothing to do. And if I get some, for example, a peak because there's a Black Friday event or something around this, I can then tell my deployment, hey, now you can completely scale up. And now combine this with spin, with this easy, uh, with the fast spin up times, uh, you can really create a system which can automatically scale completely in, in horizontal. And when the workload is completely managed and everything is uh, back to normal or back to the threshold we think it's normal, it can completely scale down again. So now we see some of the pieces of the benefit if we stick them together. Abstraction of infrastructure, um, scaling on specific events, scaling on uh, specific situations I have, combined with uh, SpinCube to deliver our VASM workload, it's perfectly fine. Um, why is KEDA so cool? Yeah, it makes auto-scaling really, really simple, so um, that's one of the points. Uh, it's event-driven, that's what I also like very much. It's a huge number of built-in scalers so you can really select. There's everything I even created. They have an HTTP scaler. I created also a, a Minecraft deployment where it will scale down the Minecraft server when there is no connection going on, so that's really good. Um, uh, the last, yeah, one of the parts, uh, save the planet. Yeah, that could be also something reducing. So I would say not save the planet, but maybe save your, 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 your wallet <laughs> because you maybe uh, don't need to pay so much anymore, and it's vendor agnostic, so that's very cool. Again, CNCF project. Okay, so now we got the next point, the next ingredients. Let's talk now about our hopefully final one, which we need to, to before we head over to the demonstration, is then golden path. So our road to success, we know now everything is there. But how we can deliver this now as a platform engineering team to our customers, so what is this? And one of the things you may heard is the term golden paths or paved paths. Um, where we say, okay, let's deliver something. So what is the idea behind this? So what we now offer as a platform engineering team is we offer now a form of a pre-architected and supported way to build and deploy a piece of software. That's very important. So pre-architected means in conjunction with our customers, we come up to say, okay, let's build a golden path together. They give me input what they need, you know, which plugins, whatever. Uh, and then I will add this, for example, um, with things I have from my security department. So I could say, okay, let's use a distro-less um, container to reduce any CVEs, or let's us auto-inject in our um, Jenkins pipeline, or let's auto-inject in our GitHub's, um, uh, no, GitHub uh, workflow, let's auto-inject, for example, Trivi or another scanner just to find uh, vulnerabilities because this is maybe something development team doesn't care or don't have the time or the knowledge about this. So I can take care of this, taking the, the, the input from them, adding the input from the security team from, from other departments inside my company and create now this, this golden path. And 
I give out the promise now that it's supported, that's very important. Supported is really important because when the people join now my golden path, they can be sure they get the best uh, feedback around this. They get, for example, also upgrade information. So when I create the version two of my golden path, I can tell everybody who early adopted version one, for example, hey, this is the way to, to upgrade. This is maybe a breaking change and so on. And this is how you keep always on the golden path because uh, then I can support you every time. But, 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 we don't want to become a new uh, ivory tower because that was also my former company, always the fear of development. Oh, they're going to clamp down my freedom and so on. So no, no, no. Um, it's not like this, so um, you get support, but you have also the way to break out of this, but you have to be sure that as long as you stay in the supported way, you have always the perfect way for production, and, but you can also leave of this, so that's also a thing to say, okay, we give people the freedom to leave the supported way. They have to be in a, then completely aware then when we leave this golden path that you cannot call me and ask me for help and so on. Again, real life, he will call his manager, Engin doesn't help me, and then my manager call me and say, hey, Engin, why you don't help these people? I know, but in, in, uh, most of the time, you make it clear to the people, okay, you can break out because you want to try something new. We want to foster innovation so you can, uh, but be sure that I'm not help, cannot help you 100% like I would with a supported golden path. So, question will be then like, okay, that's nice, so what is in a golden path? And the longer I stay now in, in this um, business, <laughs> uh, the more I realize, yeah, it's really true, it depends. So it depends, before I was like, yeah, that's a lazy answer of people, but now I find out, no, yeah, it's not like that easy, so yeah. It depends, what is in a golden path, it depends, and what is more in detail, it depends what you're going to deploy. So there is no really like, hey, this is the, the the, the recipe, this is a silver bullet. If you follow this, this is always your golden path. Listen to your customers. So because now we come also into the subject to say, okay, um, we treat our infrastructure as a product. We treat our platform, what we create as a product and also communicate with the stakeholders, security and so on, and our customers, developers, to find the best way and to create this golden paths together. Maybe there is a guild or something already in your place. You can connect and get all the information and feedback. But there are some minimal things which should be in a, golden, uh, in a golden path to create your internally developed application. Again, I put it here as a wall of text. Um, so one thing is a, a repository template. So you have your, 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 for example, your GitHub template and have a workflow or, uh, folder and maybe have a, um, a cookie cutting for your Go application or a cookie cutting for your Rust. Um, a pipeline, as I mentioned before, so that people can just really start, they, they order this golden path and then everything gets deployed, transformed with the template engine and they're ready to go. Uh, important is also the manifest to so deploy the application depending again your, of your runtime. Here in my case it's Kubernetes, so there will be some kind of uh, Kubernetes helm or customized files lying around. Um, the infrastructure to deploy onto it's also something to say, okay, if I'm going to build a static application, maybe I already ordered, uh, order when they uh, execute the golden path, the S3 bucket or the Vercel or what you're going to deploy here. Um, observabilities baked in, this is also something which uh, sometimes uh, fall uh, from the table, as we say in German. Um, so this is also activated. And most important part is security. So as I mentioned, having TreeV or something like this already installed or taking care that you use a, a chain guard image with uh, zero CVEs. Okay, at the end of the day, ta-da! We have now created this here. We have now our internal developer platform where we have a platform engineering team. So think about the picture from before. So now we have our platform engineering team which, create, which builds now services. We have our developers who consume the services and they're using the platform we created which has different layers, security, DevOps, infrastructure, operations, automation, and of, on top of it then we have all the different products which we maybe integrate into this. So um, GitLab, uh, Zona Cube, and so on. And most important is here, the platform, it sounds sometimes easy, but the platform should be still flexible enough to react for new trends, as we can see, for example, here with Wasm. It should be extensible, cloud agnostic, and composable. That's uh, some of the requirements I would have for the platform. It should not be something like, hey, I start already with maybe a cloud agnostic in mind because my company is really on Azure, so why is the need? So again, we don't do stuff which we don't need. 
Um, so uh, maybe cloud agnostic will be not in the focus at the beginning, but uh, we, should, we want to be very flexible. Okay, so we talked also about this point, and now comes the big question everybody's probably asking, like, again, what problem does this text solve? So what are you trying to do here? So it's a good question. It's a good question. So um, I can only um, mention here also Matt Butcher from the CEO of Fermion. I hope I quote him right because uh, it took a little bit time to, to find out who coined this term to say, okay, Wasm is considered as the third wave of cloud computing. So we know the first wave was virtual machines, the second wave are containers, and we know now it's the third wave um, is Wasm. So we stay at top here and we take care that all the benefits I mentioned before and all the benefits you maybe already experienced with you because you start using Wasm um, are enabled and are able to deliver to our developers. And the next point which I found uh, interesting is to say, okay, we're now enabling our devs that they use Wasm in a golden uh, path in a compliant and supported way. So because maybe they already started to work on this and so on. So we find out, hey, this is very uh, interesting for the company. So why not take it early and provide this golden path, as I mentioned, and um, have it then delivered to our developers and then they can start work with it. Okay, so now I made the foundation just in time for the demonstration. So here's the QR code. I will also um, show it again for the demo code. Uh, the slides will be uploaded, so if you're not um, copied it now, you can check it later. So the demo architecture again, um, platform engineering team using here in this case Pulumi infrastructure as code to create the cluster, the hub cluster, which will be the first thing we're going to deploy is Argo CD and backstage, so these things will be deployed. What Argo CD is doing then going to a Git repository and install GitOps way all the things we need for our platform. So having here external secrets operator, uh, cert manager, um, Postgres DB, Dapper and all the stuff, get, everything gets deployed. Um, automatically via GitOps. And the next point is then, then comes the development team, again go to the platform and order the stuff. Okay, so before we lose too much time. So this is, uh, okay, this is not Argo CD, sorry. So let me, let me mirror my screen because then um, it's easier. So, okay. So this is when you log in into Argo CD and then uh, you execute the, the code in my, in my repository so everything gets deployed the GitOps way as you can see. Um, if I do a change in the GitOps repository, it will react on this. So this is the Argo CD view, um, change a property and automatically Argo CD will detect this and deliver it. So we covered here this part, the delivery part of the thing. Coming now to Backstage. So Backstage is here installed and we have uh, different um, properties here. So we have our user. I created here now um, a typical company. We have here um, different departments. We can say, okay, we have infrastructure teams and so on and so on. So now most importantly is now, um, let's go here to the create part. So we can see there is the, the template, the golden path I created. It's the microservice with Depper and SpinCube. So I can uh, go uh, let me go back here. So let's go to templates because now I have I created now this transparent template of a golden path so that the team can click on it. They can look up the, the source code. They see now here the template. They can gain confidence in the golden path. They can create a pull request if something changes, it's not up to date. So here completely transparency of our, um, of our golden path. And they say, hey, that's nice, that's good, we're going to use this. So they can go and launch to the template. And then we can uh, collect some inf information. Again, this is completely up to, to you as the platform team, which informations you want. For example, here, deploy Kafka UI, yes, no, and so on. Which namespace I would like to have. Again, I'd enter here some random informations. Then I can create... Um, which GitHub repository I would like to do, or uh, Azure DevOps, and then we make again, la la la, that's not important. So we see the information, so everything, self-serve, this is something the, the development team can do on their own, as one of the stories I exposed. They click on create, 
they see now here the creation mechanism and hopefully, yes, it's working. Let's go to the open source repository. We see now that everything is transformed. My WasmCon application, so the template gets transformed into real code. I filled out all the information. If we go to customize, we see now um, the namespace is set. So all the properties are set. The people are good to go now. They can just start to, 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 to code because everything is already wired up. And Again, I can also see now who owns this. So I see now in my component catalog in Backstage, I see, hey, this is all the applications deployed here in my company. Let's see the VasenCon. And then we see who's the owner. We see the team, the infrastructure team, and so on. We can click on the infrastructure team. We see now the members of the team and what services they own. OK, that's also working. And now before I let you off the hook about this point, let's see what I created as a demonstration for the Vasen. So everything is deployed here, as you can see, my, my external DNS, everything is set up. And I deployed here now um, a dead job generator, because that's uh, why not. And you see that the backend is completely scaled down to zero. It uses a Kafka in the end. So let's head off. Again, I'm using eat your own uh, dog food, so I'm using here now my deployment, so I can see now the Kafka queue, I see the topics I created. So I would like that you folks head to this QR code and just generate one. So you don't need to enter anything, it's just to, to execute here now um, the request coming in and hopefully it's work, I swear. If it does not work, I'm, I have to resign my job. <laughs> That's, uh, so, but uh, we see now, um, something goes on now here in the, in the deployment. So yeah, we see it got deployed. So there is the first stuff coming in. And let's see on our Kafka, we see the topics. Let's see under message, we see also messages coming in. And we see the first code comes in. So uh, let's see. Ah, we can see also the backend scaled now to five. I remember it was just before zero. So because there was nothing going on, so I set everything to zero. And now we see workload pick up because I set up here everything to, um, to, to, uh, to use here the... Okay, so why he's returning here uh, zero. So we somehow we killed the demo again. Ah. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm so unlucky with this, okay. Maybe it's too much going on. Okay, but still, something's coming in, so uh, it works. Maybe we just killed a little bit the, the API endpoint. Okay, and yeah, that's the, the demonstration, so it should normally fill. I did a dry run at my company and everybody worked with, but somehow this is now not working anymore, okay. <laughs> but it did at the beginning. So the idea was of this application, yeah, it um, um, has different parts, and then connecting to a dead joke uh, API endpoint, getting the latest dead joke, and then um, um, creating also an image using the open API image generation. Let me try again also on my side. Uh, HTTP, okay, so I don't know why it doesn't generate a UI anymore. Okay. So let's head back, but it worked for the beginning. Okay, so play from current slide. Okay, so we saw the architecture, we saw the different parts going on, we saw the motivation of it, why we should enable this, so I gave you a little insight about uh, platform engineering and how we can uh, provide Wasm as a service or as a golden path for our internal developers. And yeah, I'm open for some questions. Thank you. Thank you. I have this microphone, so if you want to know something, I can share this. Where do you get your memes from? Sorry? Where do you get your memes from? Um, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's, uh, publicly available memes, so sometimes also my sick mind coming up some dank memes, but yeah, that's a thing. Okay, then if there's no question, I've, oh yeah.
Thanks for the talk. Yeah, I was curious, can you talk a little bit more about how you manage infrastructure? So you had this application. Uh, I think at one point you were selecting a Kafka cluster. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how does the uh, topic got created? Is it in the Dapper specification or is it somewhere else? Okay. Okay, that's a good point. I jumped a little bit over this to not bore, bore you too much, so let's just have a, because everything on my place is done via, uh, where is it, via Kubernetes. So in this case, I did not need to create now dedicated infrastructure, but what I could do now, um, let's have a look into our um, deployment. So this is the application, and we have here uh, the customized folder. This is what I prepared for the demo. And we can see now it's, uh, I create, for example, Kafka. I have a Kafka operator running, so everything is really on Kubernetes. So um, when the team orders the Kafka as part of this uh, golden path, there's also this definitions, and I can set up the topics and so on. So you could see in my backstage, I, I just pre-selected some things, but I could go deeper. I could say, hey, if you check Kafka, I will ask you now also how many uh, topics you want, how many partitions should this have, and all this stuff. Or maybe I abstract this, I say, okay, asking for partitions, again, leaking some of the implementation details, let's talk about t-shirt size. I could say to the team, I could say, hey, are you expecting a high volume topics or something? So you could prepare everything with the um, zookeeper, zookeeper less, and so on, and so on, but the development team, they don't care. They say, okay, I need a topic which I can listen to and subscribe to, and it should handle following amount of message, for example, and then I take care, I, they could say, I want a production grade Kafka, so I take care as a platform engineering team when they tick production in the selection that it's already scaled out with uh, three different brokers and all the stuff, but everything happens here. If you say, I would like to, to also let people order infrastructure, you could use, for example, uh, Pulumi, you could use Crossplane also as part of this template and just execute this stuff. I hope it makes sense. Okay. Depper, okay, good point. Depper is here, it's an annotation. So what I do is I just annotate this and then again, I could activate, I could ask the team, do you want to use Depper, yes or no? And then uh, activate this here with the annotation and I have also the Depper components here. Again, because I use the Depper um, Kubernetes approach, there's a Depper operator and then I just deliver the component and as you can see now, it's here the PubSub and it used the, the internal Kafka service address of my uh, Kafka I deployed to connect. So, Again, very easy uh, stuff. So that now you see things make completely sense when you uh, template things and so on. Okay, um, if, when there's no other questions, I let you off the hook and wish you a nice uh, conference day and yeah, bye.